All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 21st day of October in the year of our Lord, 2022. Well, the verdict is in on the Church of the Nazarene, my verdict, my appraisal. And so I said, thou shalt not judge. Well, the scripture says we are supposed to judge those in the church. God judges the world. We judge in the church. So this is my appraisal of the Church of the Nazarene which I've been attending for about a year, not a member, but attending, Uh, and also based on acquaintances and visiting churches, Nazarene churches, over the years, and knowing several Nazarenes uh, quite well, especially old, they were older, long time, old school Nazarenes. Uh, not everything about the Nazarene sir, there is bad. Uh, I'm talking about the denomination, not individuals. I've known people that were truly saints. They loved Jesus, but they had weaknesses. Uh, they had uh, uh, fears that they should not have had. They, had. they would have been much better served to have a solid understanding of what Christ did on the cross. And that's really the issue. Uh, let me talk about, uh, let me make a statement about the Church of the Nazarene. First of all, the purpose for their existence is to promulgate the worst of Wesley. Wesley's doctrine of entire sanctification or Christian perfectionism as a second work of grace that they equate with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the eradication of the sinful nature. This is utterly unbiblical. It flies in the face of the explicit statements in the Scripture. Uh, Wesley had a very defective view of authority. He held four sources of authority, Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. If you do that, if you hold to something other than Scripture alone, you will be deceived. You have left the door unlocked and a big welcome sign on it for the devil to come in. And he will take advantage of that. It's bad enough the way he distorts Scripture, but if you leave the door open to tradition and reason and experience, now these things are always present. We must judge these things by Scripture, not put them on the table and seat them beside Scripture as the authority. No. These are dangers in the Christian life. Uh, Ways to introduce false beliefs. Tradition is not an authority. It's merely tradition. Reason is not authority. It's just merely reason. At best, it is right thinking. But what are you thinking right about? It's how to think. You know, it's like logic. It's about how to think in an orderly way. But if the premises are wrong, your conclusion will be wrong too. It's like a mathematical thing, you know. It is not, and it's utterly inadequate when you're talking about God. If you try to squash God into something you can reason about, well, then you've reduced God to less than you. It's, uh, which is not good. And finally, experience. Experience is the most deceptive of all things. How do you know what you really experienced and where it comes from? 
you don't. You must judge your experiences by the Scripture, not use your experiences as insight into the Scripture. And because the Nazarenes do that, they're not, except Wesley's corrupted view of authority, they're vulnerable. And what they, very vulnerable. They are not evangelicals. They are not Protestants. Because Protestantism and evangelicalism, true biblical Protestantism and biblical evangelicalism, there are several factors that, that identify it. First of all, Scripture alone as the authority. Now, maybe these denominations aren't consistent in that. In fact, that's a problem. The problem that you look in their statement of faith, and like like the Lutheran Book of Concord, the the Augsburg Confession, it begins with the authority of Scripture. But then you find out you have to accept the Augsburg Confession to be part of them, not Scripture alone. So Scripture alone isn't enough. There's something wrong there. It's inconsistent. Uh, I'm just using that as an example. Uh, so it's scripture alone, and we ought to, because people don't do that consistently, that's where problems come in. Uh, that's a failure. But as far as true Christianity, it's essential. And Protestant, evangelical, biblical Christianity is biblical Christianity. Uh, when you got to strip out some of the errors, though. But that, those are hallmarks of the Protestant Reformation and evangelicalism and biblical Christianity is the Bible is the authority, the sole objective authority, not experience, not reason, not tradition. Those must be judged by Scripture. Otherwise, you've got real deep problems. The centrality of Christ I really like what Luther said, that the Bible must be understood Christocentrically. In other words, Christ is the center. He is the Word of God. He is the one who, through, through whom all things were created. He is the Savior. He is salvation. He is the grace of God. He is the Word of God. He is the wisdom of God. All these things are all bound up in him. He is the mediator between us and the Father and God. He is the perfect revelation of God. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Christ is central, or it's not Christianity. The gospel of Christ crucified for our sins, the cross, Historic evangelicalism, which is really biblical Protestantism, holds these things. Centrality of Scripture, centrality of Christ, centrality of the cross. Christ crucified for us, the atonement, where he paid the full penalty for all our sins. And fourth, the necessity of being born again. It's not just a system of doctrine. It's salvation is of the Lord. It is a real work that God does for us and then in us. Christ had to die on that cross and atone fully for the sins of the world in order for God to do his work in us. I don't want to get in a long discussion of that. It'd be tempting, but... Now, this is what historic evangelical is. Evangelicalism is, and historic Protestantism is. Going back to, you know, Luther and Calvin. Now, some of their, their offspring made it worse. Now... Wesley, John Wesley, was evangelical. He was Protestant. He held to the historic faith. However, he, because of his bad 
idea of theology, you know, he had Chris, uh, scripture as the highest authority. It allowed for other things. It opened the door for deception. And I don't know where he got this doctrine of entire sanctification except from a lying demonic spirit because it's not doesn't have its origin in scripture or in tradition or in reason or in experience. Wesley never truly experienced it. It's a deception from the devil. It doesn't, it's not sourced even in his four uh, sources of authority. None of them. So he had, that's probably his best known error. Uh, sinless, also called sinless perfectionism. It's simply wrong denied openly by the scripture first john if any man says he has no sin he has deceived himself and the truth is not in him all right so uh the nazarene denomination was started the holiness movement the wesleyan holiness movement and especially the nazarenes which was the largest branch of it it they actually as a merger of several different independent uh, things on the West Coast and the East Coast that occurred in Chicago in 1907, beginning of that. I think it was also in Texas, another meeting in 1908 that brought the Church of the Nazarene into existence. Because of what they're based on, they are not the Church of Jesus Christ. They are not a church because it's based on a false doctrine. The foundation of the Church of the Nazarene has a false cornerstone, the doctrine of entire sanctification. Which indeed is biblical. It happens at the return of Jesus Christ for his saints. We are, his saints are entirely sanctified then and not until then. Okay, now. It's, the Church of the Nazarene is not evangelical, it's not Protestant, it's a cousin of the Pentecostal charismatic movement. Both come from Wesley's doctrine of a second work of grace, the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a second work of grace, Nazarene's the manifestation being entire sanctification, which is dying out because that's an empirically false doctrine. Show me the entirely sanctified person. If I look at him close enough and long enough, I will demonstrate he's not entirely sanctified. Yeah, like Wesley. Wesley never manifested entirely sanctification. Wesley could be vile. He, he was not a... There were moments Wesley was just wicked, and his followers with him. What they did to uh, a young preacher, a Calvinist preacher and songwriter, top lady, slandered him viciously, repeatedly, ongoing. Slander of top lady is a stain on Wesley, a deep, ugly stain and his followers that, that were around him at the time, and his treatment of his wife. There's another one that demonstrate he was not entirely sanctified. So it was a theoretical thing he didn't possess. It's interesting, in the Pentecostal movement, some of the most well-known preachers, they themselves were preaching uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the speaking in tongues when they did not possess it themselves. Of course, that's a false doctrine, too, because they're not speaking in other tongues. That's empirically verifiable. You, they cannot demonstrate that they're speaking in real languages at all. And linguists who have looked at this said, no, they're not speaking in real languages. Because language has certain characteristics that are identifiable. Even if you don't know the language, there's vocabulary and structure and all these things that are necessary for, the, for a language to exist. Uh, 
and you can identify those structures uh, as a preliminary step to trying to understand the language. Then it's just a matter of understanding the grammar, understanding the, the vocabulary, the meaning of the words. You can learn a language. That's how you do it. I mean, that's how linguists look at things. That's how they can look at ancient languages. And if they have enough information, they can add en enough, like the Rosetta Stone, a, a, uh, an index into the vocabulary. They can translate ancient languages that somebody hasn't spoken in 3,000 years pretty well. They have enough material to work off of. No, they say, no, no, this isn't real language. There's some problems that indicate it's not real language. So that's a whole movement based on a false doctrine that really originates in Wesley's second work of grace. Just a different twist on it. But it was part of the same movement. It came out of the holiness movement. So something, a church that is based on a false doctrine, a lie, can't be the church of Jesus Christ. The, the, the real issue, though, is not the doctrine of entire sanctification. The real issue is the, the diminishment of Christ and Christ crucified. On their website, they say they are an experiential church. In other words, they're not theological. They're not about theology. They're not really about the Bible. They're about experience. The experience of entire sanctification. Sometimes the new birth has been reduced to an experience in some places. It's not. That's not a real way to describe it. Like it's an emotional experience. That's, there, there certainly can be emotions, but not necessarily. It's, it's an objective work that God, do, uh, an objective and abiding work of God in you that was purchased by Christ on the cross. If you have a defective view of Christ and his cross, his work, what he did and accomplished, you will have a defective church. Now, the Church of the Nazarene, and I, I had seen in here a week or so ago some things that really troubled me, and I had assumed that this was pretty much official theology. I confronted the pastor at the church I've been attending on this, I was troubled. I was increasingly troubled by things I was hearing there and not hearing. I hadn't looked in depth into Nazarene theology, and they're not really a theological thing anyway. But in this book, it's an awful lot of heresy in here about the God, very nature of God and the cross. It's uh, Greider holds to the uh, governmental view which is an utterly inadequate view of the atonement. If you hold that that is the atonement, you have no salvation. You are still in your sins. But for a people, but it fits with the Nazarene denomination because the Nazarene denomination is about your personal holiness, second work of grace, entire sanctification, and all their rules, do not drink, do not dance, do not smoke, do not go to movies, yada, yada, yada. Uh, it's about you being holy, not what Christ did on the cross, paying for your sins. And it certainly they don't accept the idea of imputed righteousness, a righteousness that God has prepared for us, that he gives to us as a free gift. They reject that, apparently and instead hold to a very, very weak view of the atonement that is no atonement at all, that God simply killed his son as a demonstration that he takes sin seriously. I'm sure it can be explained in a more complicated way, but I'm trying to give you the very heart of the idea that God had to do something in order that he took sin seriously in order to freely forgive. Grider does not believe that God is by just, by nature just. See, that is part of the problem with the Nazarenes, is they have a poor image of God, a poor understanding of God. So God did not, on the cross, let me make this clear, and John Stott in his book, The Cross of Christ, 
comes to this conclusion himself after ex explaining the various views of the atonement is that uh, Stout correctly, in my judgment, and I'm not getting this view from him, but from Scripture, satisfies himself on the cross. His justice on the cross. So God's atonement, as, as uh, Paul says, that he, what he did on the cross in Christ, so it was God himself, paying for our sins on the cross to satisfy his just nature in order that he might save sinners freely. That's an entirely different view than this. And this. So I. this is the more or less official theology of the Nazarenes. Not their, not that they're theological. Uh, <clears throat> terrible, terrible. Uh, obviously, they they don't have much sense of importance of theology anyway, because I, when I was looking through this, and I haven't read into it extensively, I looked at the similar areas, spent about an hour in it, and just scanned through it, and just looking at the character of the writing. I mean, you don't have to really dig into some of this stuff. And it is it was just word salad. It is, is a bunch of junk, all kinds of meaningless quotations. Uh, obviously, this man is an utterly inept theologian, as Kreider is also. It is just mud, 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 mud. And immediately I was thinking, you know, compared to Bavink, the four volumes of Bavink up on the shelf, the Reformed theologian, I'll take Bavink any day. I would rather have high Calvinism. He's not terribly, he's not like James White. Uh, or Robert Raymond, the much smaller reform view that is not uh, as dogmatic. He has a, he's a little more um, moderate, I would say. I, 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 he, he seems good to me. I just have a, 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 you know, some things I look at, no. Other things, yeah, yeah, I like I like that. Uh, not that everything's perfect in there. But Bavink, I mean, reading Bavink, the clarity uh, of Bavink uh, is, is refreshing. I mean, even Calvin. Calvin, even if you don't agree with him, there's still this, this open front in your face, uh, he's he's not deceptive. <laughs> he says it as he sees it. Tells it as he sees it. Uh, none of this double talk like Piper where he's throwing meaningless terms together and throwing it in your face. That that the Piper is gaslighting you. By the time you start get done reading Piper, you won't know is up is down or down is up or black is white or male is female or what it is because he throws these absolute contradictory phrases in you that are designed to, to basically jam your brain. You need to reset it, and Piper wants to reset it in his image. Stay away from Piper. Bad guy. He is not. He's not reformed. I don't know why people believe he's reformed. He does not hold to salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The, the, the hinge on which the Reformation swings. Lutherans and Calvinists may have their errors, but they're not fundamental errors. Christ, Calvinism, when it becomes errant, is when the eternal decree, the hypothetical eternal decree, becomes central rather than Christ. Then Christ has lost his place. Catholicism, when the scholasticism becomes central rather than Christ himself. Uh, pietism, which originates in Lutheranism, as a reaction to the scholastic dead Lutheranism, Luther, for all his flaws, was not dead. He was a passionate 
committed pastor that loved his people. But he had issues, too. <laughs> we all do. Uh, Calvin, for most of all, Luther, Luther the pastor. I mean, you, if you don't see Luther as the pastor, you can't understand Luther. It doesn't take much to see this either. Uh, the Calvin, the pastor, unwilling, but he was there in Geneva. If you, you cannot understand Calvin if you don't see that. Calvin as the pastor, pastor in the midst of a very hostile environment. So Luther, too, hostile. The hostility of the Catholic Church. The hostility of, of Catholic tradition and uh, Catholic theology, like Aquinas. Luther hated the schoolmen, the theologians. He said he knew that this was not Christianity. But people try to make him into a theologian. Luther's not a theo theologian. He's something else. He's like a prophetic voice and a, primarily a pastor that loves God's people. That's why the 95 Theses that led him down this road that he had no idea where he was going to end up. I mean, God doesn't tell you what he's going to do with you. If you knew, you would do a Jonah. If you knew, if Luther knew, would he have continued? I don't know. If you love God and love his people, yeah, you will. You will, you will lay down your life. Uh, but uh, the Nazarenes, the, the, the de denomination, their, their theology, what is ba it's based on, de-emphasizes Christ and his crucifixion. It does not understand the gospel. Uh, if you hold to a governmental view of the atonement, you do not have the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the center of what Christianity is. What Christ did on the cross. As I said, historic evangelicalism, not this modern pile of dung. Bible-centered, Christ-centered, cross-centered, and conversion or the new birth centered on that too. You must be born again. It must, you must have a real salvation, not a dead faith. And that your life is a result of God's work in you, his abiding work in you, and you don't do like good works in order to be right with God, but because you've been made right with God, this flows out of you as the fruit of the new creation that's in you. If you don't understand these things, you understand nothing. You have nothing. Any church that does not have those four things, Scripture-centered, of course, Christ is the center of Scripture. Luther was absolutely right. The Bible must be read Christocentrically. Christ is the message. If you read it some other way, for some other purpose, you're abusing the Scripture. Bible-centered, Christ-centered, he is the Savior. He is the Creator. He is the manifestation, or the, the exact image of God. He is the one mediator between God and man. He is our all in all. We are his, and he is, our, uh, he is ours. He is all that the church is. We are his body, and he is the head. If he's not the focus, flee. He's not the center. Flee. If your church is about something else, flee. And the cross, Christocentric, what Christ did on the cross, the Sermon of the Mount is not the center of Christianity. The cross is. And what he accomplished there, that is God's salvific work. Christ became flesh in order to do that to die on that cross.
and rise again, to bear our sins upon his own body on that cross, and to atone, to make a full and complete atonement, laying down his life once for all. Finished work. If you're hearing something other than that, flee. And last of all, you must be born again. Salvation is real. It's not just dead theology. It's not just dead faith. It is Christ, God, saves us. He works in us. He changes us. He gives us a new nature. But he leaves us in this body that in which sin dwells for now. Which is a good thing, but you have difficult to understand. <laughs> Why? So that we may learn and we may overcome. Christ is conquering the work of the devil. Some of these other views of salvation are true in a subsidiary sense. That's not the primary. Uh, the, vic uh, the victory of Christ over sin, death, and Satan is tied up in the cross. But it is all because of his atonement for sin. That is his victory over these things. It's If you don't have the center, which is his substitutionary penal atonement, you don't have anything. That is the foundation. That is the foundation of the Christian life. Our justification by faith alone in Christ alone is the foundation of the Christian life. Everything else must rest on that. You can't even talk about God sanctifying us and God's Holy Spirit in us unless that, the temple, has to be cleansed by the blood. Our sin must be put away by God. He has to cleanse the temple. That is our justification. That occurs on the cross where Christ pours out his life. He dies for sinners. So it's Bible-centered, Christ-centered, cross-centered, and the new birth, regeneration, conversion what God actually does. And a Christian is does still sin, but we're no longer slaves of sin, and there's something new in us, the new creation. God gives us a new heart and a new spirit, and he writes his commandments on our heart, on that new heart. He takes out the heart of stone. So we're, we're not utterly self-centered. We're a different creature than we were. We have something new in us. And God himself pours out his own spirit in us. And we're made one spirit with Christ, with God. And we know him. They shall all know me, says the Lord, from the least to the greatest. Personally, a personal relationship. Not just know about him. Not just book stuff. No, you know a person. You know God. You know Christ. He dwells in you. We have a, a, a exceedingly close relationship. We've been made one spirit. We are partakers of the divine nature, according to Peter. Some theologians don't understand that. They say, well, you can't know God. Well, they're... they're Biblically ignorant, then. Theology doesn't give you the knowledge of God. You can't know God through theology. You can know about God. But to know God, you have to have a relationship with him. And God has pro brought that relationship, made that relationship possible on the cross. Otherwise, if God were to come into you, you would be consumed. If God didn't purify the temple, there would be a big fire. Just like the sons of Aaron, you would find out that you are combustible because God is holy, holy, holy. And you're not. <laughs> 
you had to get a, be given a holiness that would enable God to dwell in you. That happened on the cross. That's what imputed righteousness is. A righteousness that's been prepared by God for us. Like a wedding garment. That's based on Christ's perfect righteousness, not yours. Because yours isn't good enough. No matter how sanctified you are, it is not perfect. And only God's perfect righteousness is inflammable in his presence. It can abide in continual burning, continual purifying, continual testing, because it is of him. It's not a foreign thing. It's not strange fire. No. No, it's his fire. It's his purity. It's his holiness, his righteousness. We are clothed in a seamless garment worn by Christ, given to us. Speaking spiritually, not literally. Without that, you're not a Christian church. If you have a different view of the atonement, you're not a Christian church. If you have a salvation that, that has works that contribute to your salvation, you're not a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Which narrows the list down quite a bit. So, I have to judge based on the doctrines of the Nazarenes in their own website. Their view of the atonement is such that it is sub-Christian. <coughs> it is inadequate. No one should be a Nazarene. They're not, in fact, they're, they're not moving toward repentance. They're not moving in a biblical direction. They're moving away even farther into the flesh, into utter carnality, into uh, what I would say would be Rick Warrenism, uh, the seeker-sensitive, world-pleasing church growth model, because they're dying. But it will not save them because they're turning to the flesh, turning to the world, not turning to God in repentance of their own bad view of God and his atonement. They have to repent of their foundational doctrine of entire sanctification, and they need to be born again. Not saying there aren't born again, Bible-believing uh, Christians among the Nazarenes who believe in the real atonement. There are. And according to Greider, too many which is good news. But Grider, pe people like Grider and uh, Wiley that reject, uh, not Wiley doesn't reject it as vociferously as Grider does, the penal substitutionary atonement. Grider just hates it. These people condemn themselves. They do not, they're not believing in Christ and his work. They don't have a finished work of Christ. They don't have a salvation that's of God. And hence, they have to look to their own sanctification and their own works. So the Church of Nazareth, and if you look at their website, it's like Rick Warren and all carnal sub-Christian churches. It's about making Christ-like disciples, loving the wicked, being loving, being Christ-like, you know, their vision of Christ, which is utterly uh, incorrect. Uh, you know, the, the stained glass Jesus with the lamb in his arms, that's their Christ, not the Christ that drove the money changers out of the temple, not the Christ that actually, uh, you know, confronted the Pharisees and actually laid down his life on that cross, ugly. Uh, the cross was ugly, incredibly ugly. Uh, <clears throat> that's supposed to be incredibly ugly because that's our, the ugliness of our sin. No, they, they, 
They look to self-righteousness, even if they wouldn't say that, that's what they're in effect doing, because they're not, uh, as Paul says of some of the Jews, that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, uh, and not, uh, not perceiving or understanding the righteousness of God. Not, uh, they instead seek to not knowing of the righteousness of God what God has given to us as a free gift. Imputed righteousness, not imparted, not infused, imputed. We're talking about justification. Not knowing about God's righteousness that Christ purchased and prepared for us on the cross. They seek to establish their own righteousness through good works, through keeping rules, through going to church. That's Nazarenes, tithing. They are, they are doing, they have stumbled over the stumbling block. They are seeking salvation through themselves and their works. Way too many of them. Not all, but many. They do not understand the cross. They cannot have a good view of Christ, a good view of salvation, uh, where they are. They have to, well, it's like many things. You've got a building with a corrupt foundation. The only thing you can do is destroy the building and start over. And that's where the Nazarenes are. At least that's my judgment. I'm not the Lord, but I look at this stuff and, and I see Christ is not central. The cross is, is not central. It's not really understood. It's not what's talked about on Sunday morning. If anybody doesn't believe me, just look at a dozen Nazarene churches on Facebook and their sermons. You could probably do the same thing with a bunch of fundamental Baptists, too, and find that Christ is not really central, which is a whole other issue. But at least the fundamental Baptist, on paper, he's central, not the Nazarenes. No, something else is central. And that's a false doctrine and self-righteousness. That's really it because of a false view of the atonement. They don't really have a Savior. That's why he is not truly worshipped and truly central. Because he's not really the center of everything there. Terrible indictment, it is. But I think it's the truth. Uh, and I'm not the judge other than as a Christian looking at these things, judging in the church what is correct doctrine and what's not correct doctrine, what is real Christianity and what is not. So if you're part of, if you're a Nazarene, do you actually know Christ? Have you truly been born again? Why is Christ not central? Why are you pursuing entire sanctification? Why? Your sin's been paid for. Do you believe that your sin has already been paid for? All of it, past, present, and future? You don't need to be obsessed with personal holiness. God will entirely sanctify you indeed when Christ returns. But he has left us in bodies in which sin dwells. If Christ wanted us entirely sanctified now, we'd be perfect. We're not. And don't fool yourself into thinking you are. You know better. Don't be a hypocrite. And really, for a Bible-believing Christian that, that knows the gospel, that knows Christ and him crucified, why are you going to a Nazarene church? Why? That'd be like going to a Jehovah's Witness thing or a, or a Pentecostal thing or whatever. Christ is not central. The idea of Christ is not even correct. And from what I see about the Nazarene's ideas of God, it is defective. Defective. A defective understanding of God. Uh, in Wiley's book, 
Christ, I, I think the Christology is even defective from a, from a very cursial, cursial super, superficial. You know what I was trying to say, don't you? My tongue will not function sometimes. A very superficial look. I think their, their, their views on the Trinity and Christ himself, I was getting the sense that Christ was less than God. I mean, the language, just the, the spirit and the language there just didn't seem right. It didn't seem like Christ was fully God, but merely something that came out of God or, or something sent by God or less than God himself was a sense I got from the language. And again, I didn't look at it in depth, but the, just glancing through it is like, this doesn't look good. Um, so I think their, their, their view of God is defective. Well, if you have a defective view of the cross, that could very well have a defective view of, I, I think error tends to, uh, it's like cancer that is spread throughout the body. Uh, it, it tends to be a systemic problem. It doesn't just exist in isolation. This, you have this one bad doctrine here, but those things tend to spread throughout the entire system. As Jesus said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And that is, and Paul quotes that too. Uh, as far as error, it does. It leavens the whole lump. So there's a lot of leaven in the Pharis, uh, Nazarenes. I was going to say Pharisees. Uh, a lot of leaven in the Nazarenes. Their view of if if your view of the atonement is defective, some things. I mean, Christians we can tolerate some things. A defective atonement, no, no, you can't do that. A defective view of Scripture can't tolerate that. A defective view of of Christ can't tolerate that. A defective view of the atonement can't tolerate that. And a defective view of salvation. So those things all must be central and correct. Other things, other quirks, uh, you can tolerate, I think, maybe, if you have a high th threshold. I have a low threshold. Uh, so that that is what I have to say on the Nazarenes. Uh, uh, that's my final judgment. <laughs> as far as me personally and my family, no, we're not going to continue to go to a Nazarene church because they're not truly Christian. And I have I want to say it in stark enough terms like that uh, to warrant, because if you don't have the right view on the atonement, your faith in the atonement and Christ is not biblical. It's not saving faith. And it shows. It shows in people. You can be very religious and be very dead and lost in sin. A religious person, you know, the Pharisees were very religious. They were the most religious of Israel. And they crucified Christ. They were the enemies of Christ. Along with some others, like the, uh, I can't remember what they're called now, the temple, the chief priests and the scribes, uh, their sect, they were the enemies of Christ. Christians, those that call themselves Christians, can be the enemies of Christ if they oppose what the Scripture plainly reveals about him and substitute something else. And again, it's not always direct contradiction, it's substituting priorities. If Christ is not central, if the cross is not central, if Scripture is not central, and a salvation as defined by God is not central, there's nothing left. They put something else up, and they've raised up an idol, like entire sanctification, a false idol. Or speaking in tongues, a false idol. And it de-emphasizes 
what is truly central to Christianity. You could say the same thing about, well, I don't want to go to that right now. That'd be an entire different video. I was going to say Rome. Uh, but it always, always, as in you, we see in uh, Romans chapter 1, those who know about God through creation, the revelation of creation, for example, they reject the knowledge they have and they make idols for themselves. You see that in much of what's called Christianity, too. They've made idols rather than what God has given us, Christ, him alone, Christ crucified. They raise up other things, like the, the adoration of Mary instead of Christ. The devaluing of the cross and making something else more important like our personal holiness and pursuing holiness and all this kind of stuff. That's, that can be fatal. Be aware. Okay, so I've had enough Nazarene. Um, they are a small sect, fortunately. I'm glad there's not, but globally, they're actually they're much bigger overseas now. They've got missions and I, I was growing concerned about this, and they were going to have a mission fund. I think it was the 1st of October. I wasn't going to contribute because they it's, it's clear I've been there long enough, heard enough, that I can say, no, Christ is not central. The gospel is not central. You hear a lot of moralizing. You know, they'll preach out of the Scripture, but it's not Christ and him crucified. It's a misuse of Scripture. All right, enough of that. God save your people. We are such a mess.